Hello everyone, welcome back to Ask a Scientist Gaming, where we combine mediocre gameplay with expert science. Uh, we're, we have a special stream today. We're actually live from the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory's open house. Uh, we are streaming with an audience in the crowd. I can't unfortunately show you via camera, but we have an aud live audience as well as an on online audience. I'm Ken Hansen, Associate Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Florida State University. I'm a photochemist slash photophysicist. I do all things light matter interaction, photons driving chemical processes. But more importantly, joining me today is Dr. Laura Green. Laura, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Laura Green. I'm the chief scientist at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, or the MAG Lab, and I'm also a professor of physics at Florida State University. My work is in things we call quantum materials. I do a lot of things with superconductors, strange magnetic materials, and just when we don't know how the electrons get through the material, that's what I study and try to understand. I also do a lot of work in science policy. All right, so Laura's in an interesting position because she is not a gamer by any means. And she said, Ken, pick whatever game you want, which may be good or it may be bad. The game I actually chose for her is called Big Bumpin'. And interestingly enough, this was a game released in 2006 by Burger King. And it's a pretty casual, fun game. So we're just going to get started. All right, I'm going to get you to where you need to go. Yes, because I don't know how to do any of this. Thank you, Ken. Oh, yeah, you'll... Oh, it's fine. You'll have fun. All right, so Laura's not gamed it before. Thankfully, this game is basically joystick, and you're literally playing bumper cars. Um, it's actually really fun because this can be a four-player game. Right now, we're doing single-player. But well, I, I've certainly played bumper cars at at places with my kids. Yeah, yeah. We've always liked those. Just we actually were sitting in the cars. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, we'll give Laura a little bit of time to settle in because this is literally her first time playing this game. So we're gonna see. So which one is me? <laughs> um, I honestly don't remember. I guess you're the one that's up. standing still when you start. Top left corner. So you're gonna watch out for the holes. You're gonna stay alive, not run into saws, and yeah, here we go. Oh. Professor at EXP, thank you for joining us live. Yeah, it's Saturday during the day. This is an unusual time. Usually we're Wednesday nights or every other Wednesday night. So, Professor X, th thank you for joining us. If you have questions, we are live from the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory with Dr. Laura Green. Uh, Laura is an expert in uh, magnetic materials, quantum materials. And superconductors. And superconductors. So, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in chat. Also, live audience, if you guys have questions, uh, there's a keyboard and mouse right up front. And you guys can put your questions in chat for Laura. Oh, I think I just... Um fell into a pit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a sociologist, uh, Professor XP. Uh, I'm a sociologist. This is uh, above my pay grade. I, that's not true. Everyone cares about magnets, whether they know it or not. That's right. All right. So you're going to go down to, you can either replay or the green button. Okay. We'll just keep doing that. So if you die, we get back up again. Infinite lives on Burger King, big bumping. All right, Laura, you, you had one game to settle in. We're going to start with an easy question. Uh, Five-year-old Laura Green was not sitting at home envisioning her life being a director at the Magnet Laboratory as well as, you know, playing games at a MagLab open house. What was your journey to where you are? What was the, the threshold that made you transition to sciences and in particular your expertise now? Probably looking at the stars. Yeah. We, there were uh, science games that we, uh, that we play. There were things on television. There were just really fun and interesting museums and i just found that at a very early age i couldn't get enough of it and so i at that point i would never have guessed i'd be looking at quantum materials and superconductors i just wanted to do all the science i could i read every book i could in elementary school went into every program i could and every day i was doing science i was happy <laughs> that's amazing I mean, that's underappreciated, uh, the, the, the astrophysics ties to quantum mechanics, and it's underappreciated, big magnetic fields. Um, but also just the forces. questioning aspect. Yeah, science in general. So Curiosity. Do you, remember, do you yeah. remember a key moment where it was like, I'm going to be a physicist? Yes, now that you bring it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I went to college with my family wanting to be educated, but to be an elementary education teacher. But I wanted to do science, and they didn't want me to because it was hard to get jobs, especially for women. This was a very long time ago. And I was, thank you. No, no, and I was, I had taken 
a simple physics class in the physics building at Ohio State University, and there was a sign in the hallway that said, physics majors, fill out one of these cards. And I thought, you could major in physics? <laughs> so I did. Yeah. Now that's fun. And from there it was, it's all downhill from there. All downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Whoa, hey. It's pure. Hey, boss. Greg Bobinger stopping by. Thank you, Greg. Uh, Professor XP, e EXP, I just got back from taking my doctor to a vet appointment. His son is majoring in physics at Rensselaer Polytechnic. Awesome. We need That's more scientists. That's a great school. Yeah. yeah. All, all, all scientists all the time. I think I already fell into a pit. <laughs> no worries. I, I, think, I think I'm better at measuring how electrons go through solids yeah. than and how heat goes through solids and how the structure of solids work a lot better than that than driving bumper guards <laughs> and video games no no worries uh, that's that's one of the i mean that's literally our tagline mediocre gameplay with expert science so <laughs> if you press the green button we can try again or we can switch to a different game type I, i'm gonna leave that up to you i have no opinion on what game <laughs> yeah no worries then again, I'm very opinionated about my science. Yeah, well, well, let's start there. I mean, what what are you most excited about? What's what's cutting edge? What's what's the next big thing? Oh, the next big thing. I think right now, one of the things we have in my field is that there are so many questions. There are materials that we can use to transmit energy without any power, better MRI machines, um, better ways to store energy. And they're all different. I do a little bit of an, all those things, but it's understanding what really makes these materials tick so they will actually, um, oops, was that me again? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'll get you to one without holes in it next. Um, so what actually makes these materials tick? If we can really understand how they work, and there's many, many questions, can we make better materials for energy, sustainability, medical applications, and things like that? All right, I'll get you to another game type, just because we're going to peruse. we got an hour and 15 minutes, uh -oh. plenty of things to explore. Oh. All right, let's do this one. So this one, if I remember correctly, it's a game of tag where you don't want to be it. So if you see a progress bar over your character, you want to bump into somebody else. Oh. All right, so there's a lot of exciting things going on in the sciences. A um, uh, recent Nobel Prize in physics, the quantum entanglement and, and quantum information science is related. Right. Put you on the spot. What's your prediction for the next Nobel Prize in physics? <laughs> oh, okay, I'm definitely on the spot. Um, yeah. I would say if someone experimentally achieves that this quantum entanglement stuff was useful. Yeah, if so someone actual actually computer. made the materials, mm -hmm. um, I think that would be important. Um, also, if you think of other areas like, you know, what else are we going to do in gravity waves? And what else are we going to do in high energy physics? Mm. Those aren't my fields, but there's a lot of fascinating physics in all those areas. So I don't know what the next Nobel Prize is. Yeah. It could be in just discovering a new material. Oh, that makes sense. And that would fall under chemistry or physics, presumably. Yeah, yeah. they're all related. Mm -hmm. I've always I've always collaborated with chemists my whole life. Yeah. And I love it. Well, that's one of the deceptive things about when we go through the schooling process is that like we, we compartmentalize these things into biology, physics, chemistry, and they're disparate things, but in reality nature doesn't care. It's it's all one yeah. broad we want to know how stuff works and it, it crosses exactly. all boundaries. Yeah. All right, so Professor EXP wants to know, when teaching, do you ever work in physics in video games as examples of physics in the lessons? So do you do you teach? You're a director, so, I presume. So right now, I'm not classroom teaching, but I've taught for 30 years mm -hmm. at least, and I taught all kinds of classes. You know, the standard things like teaching thermodynamics, teaching electricity and magnetism, to, you know, things like that. But I also had this course, it was how things work. And it was a kitchen cabinet course, you oh, know, that's fun. how does a light bulb work? How does ice skating work? Mm -hmm. And through that, with ice skating, you can learn what friction is. Mm -hmm. Through how does a light bulb work, you can understand, you know, radiation of energy, you know, of light, 
and conduction of light. And so I didn't do video games because it was a while ago, but we had a lot of, I would have 10 to 15 demos in every lecture. I'm really playing badly, but you know. We're <laughs> so uh, uh, we have a follow. Give me a second. Uh, King Willie, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for Dr. Laura Green, feel free to throw them in chat. Uh, Professor EXP, to follow up on that question of physics in the classroom and related to gaming, there's actually a really cool book called The Physics of Superheroes, and I'm going to oh, put that in chat right now. A friend of mine wrote that. Yeah. Um, that's James... Kakalios. Kakalios. He was at University of Minnesota. Mi Minnesota. He's yeah. a good friend of mine. I'll see him next week. So, so yeah, tell him I love his book, by the way. I will. I will so, definitely tell him. Physics of Superheroes. Basically, James is a huge comic book nerd. And so he understood comics and he's like, students regularly in class were like, I don't care about this because when am I ever going to use this? He changed his teaching method from, you know, standard physics to teaching physics through the lens of comic Brilliant. book and comic yeah. book events. So like Spider-Man swinging is a parabola. Um, you have, you know, the flash, how much energy is exerted, how much energy would he need to eat? And so he really, he started teaching his class through the lens of comic book events. And so the book is really awesome because he goes through the history of comic books, but also talks about it in the context of physics. And I guess the students love the class now, even though it's still yeah. not relevant to their lives, but it's a topic, it's, it's called context-based learning, which, yeah, really awesome. And, and, you know, you're still learning the physics, but you're just putting in a context instead of just seeing a weight sliding down an inclined plane yeah or you know so yeah it's really an excellent book yeah no one of my favorites is the original superman couldn't fly he could just jump really high so you have to do the math if he's going to jump over a building how much upward force does he need to make that happen and so you do the gravity math it's the same thing as shooting a cannonball but you have superman doing it instead yeah so are you okay with this round or do you want to try something else uh, it's okay yeah all right we'll keep going on that <laughs> uh, Professor XP sounds like a brilliant book. I know some anthropologists who work in gaming and wor world building into their teaching. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of our previous guests, Dr. Julianne Grasso from the music department, she actually wrote her thesis on the music of Final Fantasy IV. So, uh, video wow. gaming is actually integrating much more into education and academia yeah. than than we led to. I believe. may st actually start to like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a deceptively fun game, and this was one that like. I was in college when this came out, and when you got four people playing bumper cars with each other, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Teaching sociology through comic books, that's, that's pretty amazing. All right, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll keep going with a few of our, our standard questions we really like to ask is, um, what is your airplane conversation like? And what I mean by that is you sit down next to someone and they ask you, what do you do? And you give them an answer. What is, what is that exchange like usually? I, I have a funny thing that I would do when I worked at Bell Laboratories, mm -hmm. which is if you tell someone you're a physicist, it's a complete conversation stopper. <laughs> so I used to say things like, I work at the telephone company. Yeah. But then there was another thing which I really liked, which was what I do grow is thin films of superconductors. So we have different methods of, if you've ever looked into a mirror, that's a thin film of a metal on glass. Yeah. And that's, that's a thin film. So I grow thin films. And I study disorder in thin films. So what happens to the electronic properties if, if there's impurities in it? So I used to say, I make films for a living. In fact, I make dirty films. So. <laughs> that's a good way to frame it. I like it. Uh, that's pretty fun. I mean, so that's interesting. As a chemist, like, I sit down and I'm like, I'm a chemist. And the usual response is either I hated that class or you must be really smart. <laughs> and I have an answer for that one, too. Oh, for the okay. really smart or hated it? So the hated one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, I have an answer for both of them because I've heard them all. But but the one about I hated it. So um, I, I sat down with someone and I said, I'm a physics. And I go, oh, I hated physics. I just really. And I said, oh, really? What do you do? Well, uh, you know, I'm in nursing. I said, so I just respond with, oh, I remember taking a nursing course. I really hated it. And then it tells them how they sounded and we laugh and yeah. we get over it. No, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that you're so smart. I say, well, you know, we all have to know our own language and how to do these things for a living. And that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So. And the reality is, I mean, most of us are not... Uh, 
beyond brilliant. In fact, there's really interesting research studies that an IQ above 120, you're no more likely to win a Nobel Prize than anyone uh, IQ of 160. It really comes down to hard work and dedication and a little bit of luck. Yeah, I, I like to tell my students that who see me make mistakes all the time, and you're watching me in this video game right now, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, people make mistakes. It's all new territory, mm -hmm. and I love to tell them, see, if I can be successful in physics, you can too. So. <laughs> And yeah, a lot of it's hard work. A lot of it is just, you know, the love of it and being creative. Hey, I hit a puck. <laughs> yeah, and, and the luck thing is non-trivial and it's really neglected sometimes because timing is everything and getting in the right area. But also, the more you do, the more you try, the more you fail to succeed, the That's luckier a good point. you are. Like, it's just... That's it's, a good point. So, luck is important, but you have to be well-situated for it. Yeah. Right, so there's many, many people who are... who have some luck but they they don't have the knowledge they don't have the background they don't have the experience mm -hmm. so constantly gaining that knowledge background experience talking to people trying different experiments that that's how you when the luck comes your way then you're well situated to take advantage of it yeah and and, and failures failures uh, are just discoveries if we learn from them professor exp added that comment in there and that's very true I mean, there's Absolutely. a lot of really cool examples of this are uh uh, in the chemistry department of Florida State University, the late Harry Croto got a Nobel Prize yeah. for discovering buckyballs, which is a C60 carbon buckminster right. fullerene ball. And that was an accidental discovery. Right. They were not trying to make that, but they recognized there was a weird signal that existed on their mass spec. And they were like, the only math that works out is if this is 60 carbons. And they said, how do we put 60 carbons together? Right. And the answer is a soccer ball. And that's an accidental Nobel Prize. Which I've had several accidental ones that, that you you have to be in a good position to say, why did this happen like this? Yeah. And then you have the ability to analyze it. Yep. And ask your buddies, why did this happen like that? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And hopefully it opens the door to something new because that's... I mean, it's one of those things you can grind out a topic that exists and you can indefinitely study it, but it's really the, the weird observations that push science forward. There's something like, we can't explain this with our standard Hi. models. Hi. Hi, kids. <laughs> oh, the man, I don't know what I'm doing here. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, well. Uh, Okay, so the one that's not moving in the beginning will be me. <laughs> yes, that's the easiest way to identify. So I'm in the upper left. Okay, I'm in the green card, the bluish green card, or the. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, so so speaking of airplane conversations, uh, if you could, I mean, we literally have do dozens of viewers with our stream, but if you could reach out to the world and teach them one thing about your expertise, like what is the thing you wish everyone knew? the importance and one thing that I did get from someone here was that if you look at your cell phone okay 25 years ago most of those materials didn't even exist mm -hmm. and so the importance of materials research to change our world and I sent, sent earlier that I'm quantum materials you don't really have to understand what quantum is but it drives the majority of our economy so just not being afraid of it just being able to read it and understand it and, and not even understand it, just so knowing it's there and learning what you can. I mean, so along that line, um, like science funding, we have to justify why we do basic research to politicians and you're involved right. in policy and things like that. And cell phone is a really fun example because Einstein yeah. relativity, that's the reason GPS works on your phone. Right. And so, so when you're in this involvement and you're, you're talking about the mag lab and saying, here's why this is going to be relevant to your life. What's your, what's your pitch to your average politician? There's many pitches. One of them, of course, is the MRI pitch, mm -hmm. right? Where some guy in New York is a scientist and he was just curious how atoms, particularly nuclei, move in magnetic fields. And he just studied that, and that grew into MRI. So when people say they want to, they don't want to do physics, they want to do medicine because they want to help people, no, go back. You know. yeah. And how x-rays were discovered, none of this was, was planned. Some, some research is planned, but, but not all of it. And so if you have a certain amount of time playing in the sandbox, trying on ideas, the high risk, high reward research, that, that's really important. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the first NMR was of ethanol, wasn't it? The, 
The first NMR spectrum? I don't know. <laughs> it, it was, it's, it's one of those things it like ethanol. Be. It was well known. The structure was yeah. known. The composition was known. But just to show that you could do ethanol. And for those of you not familiar, I mean, we do something in, in chemistry called the NMR, which is nuclear magnetic resonance, trying to look at structure of molecules and how atoms connect to each other. Um, the applied version of that that most people are used to are MRIs. And that's magnetic resonance imagery, which basically uses the same technique to look at water in the body and make images from it. Right. And so that started with very fundamental nuclear resonance measurements, which is, I, I'm sure, I mean, well, I don't know. I don't want to be too confident. Do you think they saw it turning into MRI? Do you think they saw the utility that it was going to be? Not in the future? beginning. No. They just said. I, I'd have to look more into the history, but it was decades and decades. Yeah. To actually transition. And, you know, thing. just f figure it out, et cetera, et cetera. Like, you know, the semiconductors that are used in your telephone and on this gaming stuff that I'm looking at right now, the screen. Yeah. Um, you know, that history isn't very long. You know, the whole idea of chips, right? That's, you know, the whole idea of inventing them and making a transistor, well, it's certainly less than 100 years old. Um, the f I would say the late 30s, early 40s are when they started realizing it and making the first chips. Mm -hmm. and I, but it was huge amounts of research and entrepreneurship and, and decades and decades and decades of funding from our federal government. And, and I like to point that out. It wasn't some guy in his backyard inventing an iPhone. What went into discovering the iPhone was decades and decades of sustained funding for the fundamental scientists. Right. Try it again. Okay, get go. Yeah. Hey, Is that yeah, what we have to the do? The green button, that's it. Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I didn't know I, was, I wasn't paying attention, so. People aren't asking questions. I don't push it. Bring more things up. Oh no! I, I, well, it's a Saturday morning. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. Well, usually we do this Wednesday nights uh, between eight and eleven p.m. and okay. we drink alcohol while doing it. Oh, <laughs> so, well, that's that's sort of hard to do on a Saturday morning. Uh, yeah, exactly. So. And with all this complicated equipment here, that's I gonna, not. I was going to say I don't think the Mag Lab staff would let me uh, <laughs> bring in alcohol for this, but. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. We, we, we definitely enjoy it. Let's see if I can find my browser here. <laughs> I was just going to oh. bring up an image here, actually. So this is I'm under just happy I can move it all on this thing. Whoops, I missed it. So this, this is an image of the first transistor. And so it's like paper clips and gallium and they just put it together and that I mean that thing's like two inches tall. That was proof of concept of transistor and now you have a hundred million of those inside your computer. So just to give you in context to basic I was, research to apply. I worked at the place where it was invented. Yeah. And I knew some of the people that were the inventors and got that Nobel Prize. My technician at Bell Laboratories worked for them. Yeah. And he was asked to go to Washington and demonstrate that first transistor. And he brought his wife with him, and his wife wasn't allowed in the building because they didn't allow women in this academy building. <laughs> Jeez, that's brutal. So that would have been uh, in the 40s. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that was that was it. And Professor EXP, you are absolutely right. The myth of the individual scientist tolling alone discour uh, discourages some from believing themselves to be innovators. I mean, it is, it's a collaborative effort across the entire globe. And I love my collaborations. I have a lot, and we just, and it, from the outside, it might sound tough, but we're questioning, you know, did you, did you have the setting right of the current when you took that? Something looks funny here, or I don't agree with your interpretation. And we're not attacking each other. We're just trying to get to the basic of this. I didn't hit the, the goal. Yeah, the game. No, we'll, we'll get you to another game type, <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of mesmerized by the picture, not knowing that I'm supposed to actually interact. Yeah. Now this is so we have we have two different kind of guests on Ask a Scientist Gaming. We have guests that aren't gamers who they really struggle to play games and talk at the same time. You also have uh, guests that are actually gamers and they try to focus too much on the game and not answer the science. <laughs> so it can be either end. Do I win the record of being the worst gamer ever? Oh, I'm not going to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> too, I just too many want to hit involved. these extremes, and if I, you know. Yeah. No, absolutely not. And and in your defense, you're playing all this for the first time. So I'll, 
There's a lot of leeway in this. And I've actually never held one of these gaming things before. Controllers? Yeah, I oh. I think I got them for my kids, but... Hamster Licious, welcome back to the stream. Thank you for joining us on this Saturday afternoon. Uh, unusual time, we're live from the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Our guest today is Dr. Laura Green, who's an expert in superconducting materials, quantum materials, uh, materials in general, uh, adding defects to thin films. Um, uh, Hamster Licious says, I just sat through a seminar on Raman spectroscopy. I am blown away at the robust robustness of the technique. Ten years ago when I first started hearing about Raman, it was very basic. Now with the colla uh, collaborations, Raman is capable of determining phenotypes of individuals with one picogram materials. Yeah, no, it's uh, Raman is a very, are you familiar with this technique? Yeah, I've it's done the, Raman spectros yeah. spectroscopy before. It's, so we're used to a lot of optical spectroscopies where you just shine light on something and you see what i, ha I actually hit yeah, yeah and it, it was that wrong i apologize okay. oh. so i you don't have to blame me <laughs> no, so, exactly. so we're used to things like if you if you see oil on water you see a, a little bit of a rainbow sometimes you can see a rainbow in the sky um so we use the spectroscopy where we shine light on it and see how the light transmits how it's absorbed how it's reflects raman spectroscopy i won't go into a lot of detail but it absorbs the light coming in and has a transition and jumps, the atoms jump to a different energy level and then spit out a different photon. And so how that transition happens, you've got you know, the energy level of an electron here, it absorbs a photon, a light ray, and it jumps to a different level and it goes, I'm gonna get rid of this now. <laughs> and so a different color light comes out and it tells you a lot about the internal properties of the material. Yeah, Ramon is one of my new favorites. We actually use it to uh, try to identify how molecules bind to surfaces. And it's essentially looking at how atoms vibrate and like a carbon and oxygen vibrates different than a carbon carbon. Yeah, and so exactly. you can actually identify what's being influenced, what's what's changing shape based on Ramon spectra, which is pretty and fun. The other thing that's complementary to is one of my measurements is tunneling. Yeah. So I measure how electrons jump around inside the material by seeing what gets out and where. Mm. So that so tunneling spectroscopy also tells you if you have carbon and hydrogen, how those oscillate together how, you know, certain carbon, carbon compounds, how the electrons are in there. And so with, with my kind of measurement, it also helps understand how the electrons transmit electricity in mm -hmm. that material. Uh, what's really cool uh, following up with that professor is uh, there's confocal microscopy now where it's not just surface profiling, but you can actually depth profile. So you can know what's happening at the surface and what's happening internally and actually get a map of in the Z axis, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. Do, do, do Professor EXP, there's some really nice work in sociology of knowledge and technology and the practices of collaboration that lead to discoveries. Oh, you want to be a good collaborator, <laughs> then more people want to collaborate with you. And so that's part of the mission at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory. Like that's in your, your renewal and all those criteria. How do you guys facilitate those collaborations? Well, a lot of communication. And I will tell you that people, they're always learning. The National Science Foundation actually has developed several programs where, um, where they help facilitate people from disparate areas to communicate better. Like if you're from different countries, if you have different backgrounds. And if you wanna, and this is so important, and sometimes people don't recognize this because they think, oh, they only wanna talk to people that look like them. But if you have the same people with the same background, mm -hmm. always looking at the same questions, you are not going to get anywhere. And if we want to attack the fundamental and the applied problems of the 21st century, we need people from all walks of life to look at the problems with different directions. I don't even know where my car, car is. Yeah. I mean, so have you seen the recent study? I mean, this is kind of well known that most academics come from the same, you know, 10 institutions. It's heavily yeah. biased towards the top tier. I mean, and that's that's been that way, 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 way for hundreds of years. Is that, I mean, is that something we need to consciously address? We need to consciously address that. I mean, so how do we do that? I mean, we obviously look at applicants from everywhere, but I mean, there's an inherent bias towards big names, towards big schools. One, one thing is that don't just look at what they've published on paper and don't, you know, really talk to the candidates really understand what the candidates are from. If they come from a background where they didn't, where their high school physics wasn't as good, mm -hmm. yet they, they built a house, <laughs> they probably do have the skills. So, so 
I think what's important is making sure that you spend time with the candidate, with the applications, and just don't look on paper. Mm -hmm. And not one person makes the decision. You need a committee. That's the other thing. Yeah, a committee of diverse individuals with diverse yeah. expertise, really assessing, you know, what are our goals here? What are we actually trying to achieve? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, there's all kinds of evidence that diversity in approach is fundamental to making physics, probably any scientific discovery. There's a lot of studies that have been done on that. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite is is when the Soviet physicists worked with the American physicists when there was a lot of nuclear weapons and it was worrisome. Um, yet the diversity in being trained in the Soviet Union and being trained in the United States, they had different approaches and they figured out things that were never figured out before. I mean, we really want our science to step above that, right? The of the, the the political and economic. It's tricky. And, yeah, One it's thing I work on is science diplomacy, and this is a multi-changing world, you know, geopolitical world. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. It's not it's not simple, but we we need to do it, right? Because if people from all over the world can't access the fields that we have here, mm -hmm. they can't access the probes. They can't access many many things. And so we want people to come from their own laboratories in the United States and internationally. So large facilities and, and also the diversity in approach. Mm -hmm. I think, am I moving here? I think one of my favorite <laughs> examples of that uh, from chemistry, I think it was, it was when they were naming elements of the periodic table. And it was, they were advocating for, Men I think it was Mendelevian, right? After, after Mendeleev, who basically gave us the first per periodic table. And one of the problems was this was during the Cold War. Right where animosity between the U.S. and Russia was so high, and and I mean it was it was science we want to step above that, and it was ultimately named after Mendeleev, which is awesome. But yeah, and that that was exactly I my mine was another example of exactly that time mm -hmm. that in fact it was in the field of superconductivity that we had people from the Soviet Union and the United States they worked and worked and worked, and when they got together. The interaction helped them solve this, This, you know, how does a superconductor work, those kinds of superconductors. No, so, met, so the periodic table and superconductivity, Yeah. We, need, we needed them. We don't agree politically, but we need the science. Um, Space Nomad, sorry I missed the follow. Thank you for following us. If you have questions for Dr. Laura Green, put them in chat. Just talking about magnetic materials, quantum materials, talking from a live stream at the National High Magnetic Lab Field Laboratory where Laura's playing Big Bumpin' from Burger King for the first time ever. So, how are you liking it? Uh, it's okay. Uh, sometimes I get attracted to it, but then I get off into discussing the science and I stop paying attention. It's yeah. like the old focus of a scientist, right? <laughs> CRS, hi, welcome to the stream. First time chat, thank you for joining us. If you have questions, throw it in chat. I mean, so, so going along the, the lines of this politics, we have we have examples where science rises above it, but there's other ones, um, uh, if you're familiar with Fritz Haber, um, he did the Haber-Bosch process, which made ammonia and half the world owes their existence to him. But also he's the father of modern chemical warfare. And he was quoted during World War I as saying, you know, at times of peace, science belongs to the world, at times of war, it belongs to your countrymen. And so he was a strong advocate supporting, you know, German invasions and things with chemical warfare. But also, saved half the world because of fertilizer, which is kind of crazy. So, yeah, there's examples on all sides of the coins across yeah. the sides. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to ask a few, few fun ones. I, I, you don't have to answer any question I ask you if you don't want to, but okay. uh, what's, what's the biggest mistake you've seen in lab? Either something you did or you saw somebody else do? I think anything that involves safety. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have much better constraints on how to do things safe now. And there have been mistakes. People have gotten hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't understand all those things before. Um, the old high energy physicists used to go blind because they would line up the beam with their eyes. Yeah. Um, we didn't have the constraints on, you know, I've done a lot of work in x rays. And, uh, you know, you have to be careful. You know, so, so I would say that th those are the things you really have to worry about. The mistakes that don't involve safety, like you break something or you do a chemical reaction that was still safe but you didn't expect, 
those things help you understand the experiments mm -hmm. and they could lead to discoveries. So my follow up on that one, what's the most expensive mistake you've seen? I can tell you my most expensive mistake. <laughs> Which you remember vividly, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to grow a material inside of, in this gas called sulfur hexafluoride, which is a very stable molecule. And, um, and so we were going to try to incorporate it. And so we put it into this high temperature melt and we forgot that the platinum in the crucible would turn the sulfur hexafluoride into a poison. Oh. So we had to evacuate the entire physics building. <laughs> What's and it, what does it turn into? It's fluorine gas? It, huh. SF2, SF6, and HF. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> nobody Brutal. got hurt. Wow. But the platinum crucible, which is many thousands of dollars, yeah. was completely, it looked like a little flower pot when I was done. Wow, so that was expensive and potentially yeah. toxic. Oh, man. You never forget ones like that. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know about, I'm sure in these big facilities, people have made mistakes. Yeah, I mean, especially high vacuum. I mean, yeah. any of that discharging, the, the high magnetic fields, people walking into like NMRs or MRIs with magnetic things, metal shards. Uh, but we have so many constraints against that, right? So, hi. <laughs> it's David Collins from Physics, one of our hi, previous guests on Astrocyte. He gave a gaming. great talk last week. That's awesome. He gave a colloquium on star formation. It That's, was awesome. Yeah. Studies so. massive magnetic fields, magnetons, things like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> oh, Professor. I, I'm 100% sure that I do win the award for the worst gamer ever. <laughs> no I'm, worries. I'm 100% sure. Uh, we did have Jim Padul from biology play Space Invaders, and even with infinite lives, he somehow died, so <laughs> it goes. Um, Professor XP, collaborative spaces like the Santa Fe Institute become really interesting for providing cross-disciplinary environments. I mean, that's exactly what the mag lab is, right? Your chemistry, yeah. physics, engineering, biology a little bit here and there. Exactly, and it is particularly, if you walk around here, we're not just quantum materials. MRI at very high fields uh, for health discoveries, aging discoveries, uh, battery materials, uh, sustainability, um, how carbon gets into our aquifers, yeah. and also trying to understand proteins. So it's incredibly broad. On top of that, we also have strong education. We have a whole center for integrated learning and research. Mm. And so we bring thousands of people in every year for programs, side girls, summer science programs. Um, so education is an important part here and engineering, right? So we design the magnets and, and go really new designs. Um, so yeah, those are all important. And I will also mention that we really support entrepreneurship. So if someone wants a spin-off, they make a discovery, we help facilitate how they can work with industry and build industries in the region. You unlocked an achievement. Awesome. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but you unlocked it. I unlocked what? Uh, it was just a pop-up on the screen. Apparently you did something enough that it gave you an achievement. Uh, so I don't know if you're familiar with this comic co concept of gamifying where you give like tiers of achievement. It's like grade levels. And I, I have heard of that. Yeah, and it's, it's very popular, especially in role-playing games where you just slowly progress more and more. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's a, like feeding the reward center of your brain, much like a casino okay. would, right? And you just get these marks. Hamsterlicious, thank you for the 100 bits. Uh, that was a celebratory cheer for your gameplay. So Okay, yeah, that was all completely planned and on purpose <laughs> and directed. Note everyone, Laura's playing this game for the first time ever. She actually asked me, what game should I play? And I said, we'll do Big Bumpin' by Burger King Games, which is a surprisingly fun game that we don't play enough. <laughs> but... Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, it's all serendipity, right? So many materials. So I said I'm in the prop field of superconductivity. Right now, the best way to discover a new superconductor is by luck. It's called serendipity. It's um, and that's how I managed to get to the next level here on the, on the gaming. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it in gaming and in sciences. We will gladly take that. All right, Ninja Physics. So <laughs> that's fun. So when might we see a collaboration, the next Green Hansen material for super efficient solar panels? <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure out a way to collaborate. Yeah. So 
So do you actively run a lab still, or are you primarily director? I do. I do. I have people help me. I have students. Okay. And I and I do get help. I I can't really run the day to day. Mm -hmm. You know what resistors, what bolts you need, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I I do a lot of collaboration. I have people, the students, and sometimes if I run into a problem, I can bring in an old student that will help me. Mm -hmm. uh, that that you know just bring them in for a week or something. That's really fun. And it, we, are, I get along really well with all my old students, and they say, "Hey, you need some help? Yeah, give me a call." You know, so That's we're all very collaborative and supportive. Yeah. It's one of the things I really like about science is mostly that's how it is. Sometimes it's hostile and competitive, but most of the time it's very collaborative. All right, so following up on that discussion, I mean, what was your I made it as a scientist moment? What was your achievement, your gamifying of your career? What was the first, like, I am now a scientist? I think it wasn't all from inside. I, I don't know what that defining moment, but I will tell you, that when I was in graduate school, there were like four women out of about 300 graduate students. Yeah. And so it was very hard to be taken seriously. And when I got my my first job outside was a postdoc at Bell Labs, and I can go to a conference and it said, Laura Green, Bell Labs. Yeah. I felt like people would actually value my opinion. So so I think, I think that helped. Mm -hmm. The rest of it is is a process. It's not I've made it as a scientist. I'm always fond of saying that I, I just had no choice. I just wanted to do this, mm -hmm. whether I made money or not. So, <laughs> so speaking of, of major moments, um, so that was your I made it moment. What's your most like memorable, impactful moment? Like, what was your Oscar achievement for your scientific career? What was the it's funny that you asked that because I was just talking. Some of my family is here. My nephew and his kids are here, and um, and they asked me what was that certificate on the wall, and it was something called Discovery of Time Reversal Symmetry Breaking in High Temperature Superconductors. Yeah. And what that means is is that it was predicted that if you take a superconductor, special kind of superconductor, and you take it to a very, very low temperature, it'll generate a magnetic field. It was a very weird theory. It took me several years to do the experiment, but I did it. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool. It really opened up. It, it actually relates to a lot of the stuff that's being done now with topological materials. So. So was the was the moment the paper or was it the award or was it the moment of discovery? What was the, it? Was the lab? It was that. It was the lab. It was when my student Mark Covington. I'd been working together, working together, working together. Yeah. And and then, you know, try this one. Let's do this. Let's try this material. Let's try that way to measure it. Uh huh. And and just, you know, it was years of learning to grow the materials in the thin films mm -hmm. learning to grow them with at different orientations so maybe it looks like this or like this on the on the substrate and then trying different materials measurement techniques and uh it was like oh my gosh you got it <laughs> but nothing leaves the lab until you find sure. that it's reproducible yeah. and you're not kidding yourself and you open it up to colleagues to make sure you're not making any systematic errors. Uh -huh. So it took a while, but I started presenting it at, pay at conferences and I got a lot of questions like, this can't be right. And then I would go back and say, well, let me check this out. And I really, really, really appreciated the questions yeah. that I got. Skepticism is healthy and helpful. Yeah, it really helps you. Yeah. Now that's really fun, but that moment in lab when you're like that that peak or that signal or whatever it was that triggered that moment. There's there's no feeling like it. Yeah, there's world. no feeling. Like, that's happened to me in a few different things. Yeah. Yeah, it's sort of like, oh my gosh, that was it. That's it's it's real. It. Yeah. So there's big ones and small ones. Sometimes just pulling, being able to grow a film and seeing that it looked right, the the analysis, the yeah. structure looked right, and the the conductivity looked right. That's all really great stuff. But uh, contrasting that, there are moments when you think something's real and then you figure out it's not. Those Absolutely. are some of the most devastating. <laughs> Just part, it's part of science, right? Yeah. And and uh, you know there there's some big wins that that you know if you figure out that it's a mistake, that's fine. Or misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. If someone else does, there's a very famous story that got written up recently. This guy thought he discovered something in my field. 
And someone said, that can't be right, and went in the lab and did the experiment and proved he was wrong. And he came up with, he wrote a paper saying, I really thank you. I really appreciate that you found the systematic error. This is great. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't an attack on him personally. It was saying, let's figure out the ways to really understand the science. Yeah. And systematic errors are really common in these complicated materials. Well, there's there's some really devastating examples of that the, uh, the 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 cold fusion research out of Utah doing electrochemistry across hydrogen and they thought they did fusion, and they didn't do peer review. They went to the press before peer review. Are you familiar with this story? Very very familiar. I've written articles about it. Oh man, that's I. I don't know if you want to recount that, but that was not just devastating for them because, like, they left their jobs and things like that, but also it, it was devastating for the community at large. Yeah, they recovered, oh. but I mean, it, it put that, that entire research endeavor back, what, 30 years? I think any time that fraud gets to the front lines is dangerous. Yeah. And that one is, I know the history of how they decided to go to the press before peer review. Oh, really? And, I'm curious. Yeah, I know the story. And, um, and I remember, so what happened is it was University of Utah and Brigham Young University mm -hmm. both thought that they had the same discovery. And so they met and they said, okay, let's do these checks and balances and we'll publish together after we do these checks and balances. Mm -hmm. And the one, the people that you mentioned went right to the press. Mm -hmm. So, so that said, they already had some violation and trust there. What, what, what was the rationale? I mean, did they ever come out with why they went to the press rather than peer review first? So there, there's... It's human nature. Yeah, I mean, it was a I mean, it's right? wrong. It was... and, and if you're trained as a scientist, you just don't do that. Mm -hmm. The other example you may remember was super superluminal neutrinos. Mm. Remember that? that mm -hmm. made the, yeah. yeah. And, and so as, I've got a nose for this. I've studied this. I've written articles about fraud. And as soon as I realized they went to the press before peer review, I just... I knew what was going to happen, and so um, I was right. People said, oh, they laughed at Einstein. Well, no, they didn't. <laughs> you know, that's not correct. And, and there's, there's a process for science, just like when you go to the doctor, you have an operation, there's a process to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. And it works pretty well. It's called scientific method, and it's called, you know, making sure you have your reproducibility and your diagnostics. And that's both in experiment and in theory, by the way, so. And I, I mean, most of these stories, it wasn't anything malicious, right? Like they thought they genuinely had something. They weren't lying. They were just not interpreting or not doing experiments properly. Right? So I'm still writing a book on that. Oh, really? And so I will tell you that it's a combination. Okay. So, um, so one of the things I learned, so um, Ernst Langmuir wrote these articles on something called pathological science, <laughs> which is exactly what you're saying, which is, I really believe this. I think it's right, mm -hmm. and um, this. I'm not going to count that that experiment because there was something wrong with my equipment that day. They're not bad people. They just were human, and mm -hmm. they parked their scientific method at the door. And then you have the kind of person that hand draws the data. <laughs> yes. I've read a lot about this. I've studied this, and I found out they're not completely separated. You could have. You can kind of fall, you can be so egregiously that you won't, people say that can't be right, that can't be right, and you ignore them. Yeah. You could be egregiously pathological, and um, so it, it finally gets to line. Yeah, there was a recent one. It was Memristors, was that what it was, where you, you faked the data and they found out by blowing up the signal to noise, the noise region, and the noise yeah, region there, kept repeating? Yeah, there's several of them. Yeah. Yeah. That one, that was like several science and nature papers within a two-year interval that was completely Yeah, fake. I follow these, I collect them, I look at them, and I, I'm often asked behind the scenes by journals, mm -hmm. we'd like your opinion. Yeah. So, so this, yeah, I'm not just in the lab, I do a lot of other things in the... Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Professor EXP, we had a trusted professor at my institution that was found to have made up his data. Yeah. And sometimes it's egregious, sometimes it's crappy Photoshop, like, right. yeah, there's... <laughs> what does it mean to hand draw data? Oh, it means that you're going to measure the resistivity versus temperature for for this for this metal or this superconductor. And what you do is you just go to your computer 
and you invent data points without actually ever doing the measurement. So that's what I mean by hand drawing data. Instead of it's fabricating data. So that's. I mean, and we know what we want the data to look like. Like any scientist literally could do this, but scientific integrity prevents most of us. But some people, yeah, they, they, their ego or whatever it might be drives. I had forward. a good thing with my thesis advisor. I was up all night doing something at the laser. I did my, by the way, my PhD was all in optics and far infrared. Um, so we made up some overlap there with, yeah. with light and no, photons. Awesome. But, um, but I, I was up like two nights doing this, doing this, doing this, doing this. And he comes in in the morning and he goes, how'd it go? And I said, the experiment didn't work. And he goes, that's not an answer. Didn't work means that you learned something. Yeah. Could you please explain? how you know what your result was and how we're going to do this now that's a really good especially first second year grad students the, the, that's the comment it didn't work yeah and that's yeah it's disingenuous to the process really yeah hamsterlicious experience has shown me that if data looks as i expected i've done something wrong <laughs> <laughs> I entirely believe you hamsterlicious, but I get the sentiment, absolutely. That's when you do the diagnostics, et cetera. Yeah. And, and then the other thing I was taught by my postdoc advisor was there was a lot of claims in those times that weren't true. And he goes, if it looks too good to be true, it probably, probably is. is. Yeah, absolutely. Just like when someone tries to sell you, you know, a car, you know. Yeah. Here we have, you know, a million dollar car. I'm selling it to you for $10. No, there's something wrong here. <laughs> Well, so f follow up along that line, one we like to ask our guests is what is, in your area of expertise, what is the flat earth anti-vax like conspiracy theory that you'd like to debunk? I mean, so I'll start with one. The maglab controls the weather. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even think I, yeah, I have seen that one. I, I didn't know that before. And yeah. then I heard about that. When we had a hurricane that made a sharp right turn <laughs> yeah, said, and didn't hit the magna lab several months ago yep. and the question is oh the magna lab no so we have very 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 large magnetic fields much bigger magnetic fields made by humans than anywhere in the world mm -hmm. but when you make these magnetic fields they're inside of something that's an inch big so inside of so you have this this what you do, you can make the magnetic field by making a coil, and maybe you know that. But in any case, we generate these magnetic fields with electricity, and they're inside of little tiny areas, little tiny volumes. I don't even know where my person is. There she is. <laughs> um, <laughs> no worries. And, and it's surrounded by all kinds of equipment, and it's like an inch. So there's no way you can affect the outside world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and magnetic fields, those of you that aren't familiar, falls off exponentially. So, like, the field per distance falls off very, very quickly. So even the biggest, what's the biggest magnet here, 100 Tesla or 60 so Tesla? So here, the highest field that you can do with a direct kind of constant field is 45 Tesla, which now I have to, I look at this before I give talks. It's like, was it 50,000 times the size of a refrigerator? I have to look that up again. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the refrigerator magnet's a good reference, but it's yeah. one of those things when you get out to the parking lot, that field has already dropped down to roughly a fridge yeah. magnet, if you actually do the math. Three feet away from the equipment, it's dropped down to zero. Yeah. So what we have, if you come and visit here, you'll see little circles of where it goes down to where you can hardly measure the field. And so even at our 45 Tesla magnet, it drops off very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. For extra safety, that when it's running, we cordon off that area of the magnet lab but only just to be more safe than you can't be too safe, right? So, so there's a really fun, uh, this is something I learned about recently. There was this fraud example where somebody had a detection system. They proposed they could t detect like, I don't know, chemical toxins from 30 kilometers away using NMR type technology. Wow. But 30 kilometers away, if you do the math, if you need a one Tesla field at 30 kilometers, you would need basically the center of a magneton star in a device <laughs> to get that kind of field at that distance. <laughs> it's, it's you know, you're bringing up a really, really, really good thing, which is that it's always good to put in some numbers. Yeah. It's always good to just say, does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's really good. And, and for our proposals, we have to do that. Like, we yes. don't get to do the experiment first. We have to ask for the money, but we have to say, you know, according to this math, this should work, or at least we have reason to believe that this will work. And so, yeah, doing the math. <laughs> yeah, I don't need any more evidence. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then I'll also say, 
how I design experiments, okay? So when I mentioned I do quantum mechanics for a living. Mm -hmm. So I will imagine from based on my knowledge, I will take educated guesses of the direction to go, mm -hmm. making a new material, deciding what should happen. And you can't taste to see you smell quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. So my charge is when I come up with these ideas, then I design experiments that will prove me wrong or right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and before you do the experiment, you have to do some calculations like how big of a magnetic field do I need? How much current do I need? Mm -hmm. What temperature do I have to go to? And it's, it's, it's a hypothesis and it could be wrong, <laughs> but the reviewers have to decide accordingly. Like, is this believable enough that it's worth the money to make that experiment happen? All right, speaking of uh, money and experimentation, one we'd like to ask our guests is, if you were given unlimited budget and had no moral qualms, what experiment would you do? And the moral qualms, you don't have to answer that one, but for like psychology researchers, obviously that plays an important role. But for you, you, you get a blank check to do an experiment of any kind. Make a... So because my field is materials, mm -hmm. I would grab the resources across physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, mm -hmm. and theorists, and to help us collaborate and to see what's useful, make sure I fold in social scientists to, uh, you know, to, to have unlimited funds so we can design, predictively design new functional materials. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I was going to say the other next big thing, it just struck me, I'm on a committee now to look at AI. Oh, that is another next big that's thing. That's a yeah. hot area. <laughs> A hot, terrifying area. Yeah, or it can be very good. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be both, right? It's it's exactly. any new innovation is used for good and evil. Yeah. And yeah. So I've been, as a physicist, I really don't know much about it, but I've been, I'm I'm on a committee that we're looking at this very seriously. Like, what what are, what, what are some recommendations we could make, and uh, and so we're we're invoking psychologists, you know, other social scientists. Um, and of course, we're getting information from people that are running these companies, but we have to make sure that we don't, that, you know, we separate that if this company is selling this AI, we want to make sure that we keep an overview. Ninja physics, we should be really nice to AI and yeah, then how to save the save our planet. Yes, save it from ourselves. This is uh, Isaac Asimov. It can be used for all kinds of analysis of, you know, you know, it can help doctors and analyzing data. It can help, you know, all kinds of things. So we just have to figure out how to do it. Should we have it now that if you write a paper using AI or you have a conclusion or write an ad using AI, you have like a circle T for a trademark yep. or an OU that it's kosher or something like that. I mean, that's so so there, there's certain constraints we have to learn how to put on it. We're sort of in a, uh, a nuclear power, nuclear bomb, um, you know, generating, uh, engineering DNA, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do we do these things? And, and we'll, we'll study it, we'll figure it out. I Got mean, a we'll, bunch of smart people working on it. One of the fundamental problems is our, our political response to that is decades behind reality, right? And so you, you, you've worked as political advisor and things like that. How do you convince, you know, the United States Senate and House that we need to start addressing I don't, I don't this. I think legal. we're behind, to be honest. You think we're on? I think we've been, you know, right out in front. Mm -hmm. um, the Department of Energy has put a huge amount of resources with their national laboratories. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people from a lot of different areas are, are contributing to this. Yeah. And, and I, I actually don't think we're behind. Um, I think that we have to fold in what private industry is doing mm -hmm. with our national laboratories and our research universities. I, and I, I, I think I think this country is actually doing pretty darn well. And I will say that at least this administration is aware of it. And on February 15th, an executive order came out saying, let's make sure that we make AI equitable. Yeah. Because as many of you know, the people that feed into these things are maybe not feeding in the diversity that they need. Mm -hmm. And that, that may be shortfalls in understanding. What? So an executive order on February 15th, you yeah. can look it up, came out about that. So I think this administration and this whole 
and our whole uh, our agencies are looking at this very carefully. I'd like more money on it. I'd like a more freedom in discovering that. But well, I guess I'll frame that a different way. I guess how, how I originally meant it. I'd like research funding is there. They're supporting that. But in terms of the regulatory decisions on you know what's acceptable and how can it be used? And yes. Like simple things like, is that AR art original or is it a copyright infringement? Right. We, we have not. And that, yeah, so I will be talking. I've talked a little bit to regulatory agencies. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that yet. I'm just happy I can move this car at all, by the way. Um, <laughs> Do it awesome. <laughs> because so, sometimes forward is forward and back is forward. So um, yeah. anyhow. Um, yeah, so like I said, the regulators are going to have to figure this out too. We'll have to work with them. Mm -hmm. So if, if you decide you want to put an advertisement up or write a report, um, you you may have to regulate it to say this was AI generated mm -hmm. and what kind of AI generated. Oh, I didn't hit the button yet. <laughs> so this is something about me is that I start talking about the science or the physics and I totally lose track of everything and I forget to press the buttons on the game. So. Um, no worries. <laughs> We're doing our best. Uh, Hamsterlicious, how do we make our politicians better? <laughs> go see your politicians. Mm -hmm. Go, go, you know, write them, call them. If they're around, call them up and go into their office. There's nothing, they love that. Mm -hmm. I've done that many, 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 many times. Not to do anything partisan, just to say, hey, did you know that that I think this is a good idea? Or did you know that my laboratory discovered this? Or did you know that uh, my dentist has this new way of making x-rays? Do you know anything about it? Is this something you can use? So just keeping the conversation open. So there are several societies that actually have people working mm -hmm. in offices. They're called uh, fellows. They're called legis they're legislative, what they call science diplomacy fellows. Yep. And uh, so um, I'm going to the AAAS meeting, the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and they, they are sort of in charge of this program, but it's paid for by many societies. Yeah, the so APS, like, ACS, yeah. they all have Yeah, this, yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that way, it, it's sort of our charge. As a scientist, besides taking data, one of my charges is communication. And so one of the things that's important in the communication is letting people know that what's going on here. You're doing a service to the science if you let, let your politicians know. And then if you if you want, you know, go into politics. If you feel like you have something to say, we don't have enough scientists on the Hill. Professor XP, you're actually right. So, so funny you mentioned this, that uh, our guest in December was Professor Josh Melko from UNF, who actually took a year leave of ANS oh, yeah. to do that for the ACS. So he was a uh, congressional advisor for uh, Senator Markey um, from, I think he's Massachusetts, actually. But it was fun. We had Josh on before and after he did that. And so one of the big questions was, are you more or less jaded after your experience on Capitol Hill? What do you think his answer was? Are you more or less what? Jaded uh, in terms of cynical with the process, cynical with... Oh, I've talked to so many fellows. Yeah. My answer would be no. <laughs> is, that, is that he probably felt that he was able to do some communication. Yep. And, and it's an understanding, like like when you're training these these science diplomacy fellows. Mm -hmm. So one of the what you do is you there's a, like these these practices, like you say, okay, you've got to set up this report because your senator has to make this argument on the floor. Make sure you do your background material, mm -hmm. and then you go to the senator's office with the background material, and the senator says, I just found out I have to argue the other way. <laughs> and so what do you do? You go, okay, here's the new material. Yeah. So so it's sort of like you're, you're serving at the pleasure of your boss, mm -hmm. just like if you're serving the pleasure of the President of the United States, but you have to guide them in what the correct science is. There's no problem with that. Yeah, his perspective, one of the things he learned is that, you know, Forward-facing politicians aside, there are a lot of smart people on Capitol. Yeah. Like, there are advisors there, everywhere. There really are. There's a lot of really impressive people on there. Mm -hmm. And they're doing their best. Like They, some they just don't get all the PR. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're not the, the forward-facing aspect of it. But so it goes. All right. So one of our other standard questions we like to ask, the, the, the unlimited budget experiment is one of our favorites. The other one I like to ask, because I've seen a lot of movies, what movie or TV show gets your discipline expertise right and what gets it wrong? 
Like when you're watching a movie, you're like, holy crap, they got it right. Or holy crap, that was terrible. <laughs> what was, what, do you remember so, any moment? So I, I heard that you might be asking me this question. It struck me that one that has both sides of that coin is everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> So that is awesome. So I've been studying the multiverse since yeah. I was a kid, yeah. right? It, it's it, and um, and so what I really determined was that this is something that physicists know about. And so one of the things I didn't like was in that movie is that it was like, oh, is this a brand new idea? No, it's decades old. Yeah. And and so uh, so they they could have even though it's a theory that might be wrong, um, they could have done a better job on that <laughs> that's fair but i will also tell you that it's okay to get some of this stuff wrong so there's something with the academy has called the science entertainment exchange mm -hmm. and we were told that kip thorne who has a nobel prize for gravity mm -hmm. worked on the movie gravity yeah and when you watch the movie gravity there are mistakes in it and that's okay it's just not too egregious yeah and hollywood wants to sell the movies so it's you can be a little bit soft on it yeah but i really like the ones the old science fiction where you can see the strings on the spaceship <laughs> <laughs> gets it right and wrong <laughs> i mean one of the one of the fun things about science fiction and the, the the book uh the physics of superheroes one thing i like that he does really well is he's like what rules would you have to abandon for this to be true yeah right? that's like, super yeah. And it's it's just it's really thoughtful in terms of it's not that off the wall if x changes to y kind of thing exactly I really appreciate that and that's one of the things like star trek did really well is they didn't try to define warp drives or anything they just said this exists and it's easy to spend reality when it just exists. people have theorized what a warp drive really means like for instance if space is really curved would a warp drive meaning that you just fold the space in to get from one point to another mm -hmm. it doesn't matter but by not explaining it so star trek had there, there are two good stories of time travel. Mm -hmm. One is the original H.G. Wells, The Time Machine. Do I have yeah. The other? yeah. Yep. Because he kept it super simple. Yeah. And that's also true with Star Trek, is that they you don't run into too many paradoxes. Yeah. And, you know, is time travel possible? Probably not. But um, just like I don't think the multiverse is right. But, <laughs> but I love science fiction because it gives you a blank palette yeah. to talk about philosophy, interactions with people, think about where you know and the, the scientists that came to the united states before world war ii that they were fleeing germany and fleeing hungary they all read science fiction jules de Verne was their hero mm -hmm. so yeah i was just talking to a prospective grad student about this it's it's i mean one of the things i love if, if you want to see the like short-term future of science and technology talk to a scientist if you want to see the long term talk to a sci-fi writer Right, because they're going to yeah. envision a world that we aren't creative enough to imagine. But ultimately, yeah, some of them are brilliant. Yeah, I absolutely. just love them. I mean, I Robug, that guy who wrote those things, yeah. Isaac Asimov, yep. wrote hundreds probably of science fiction books. Yep. And then, right about the 60s, from, yeah, in the 60s, he decided science was moving so fast. Instead of writing science fiction, he would just write science books. Oh, I didn't know that. And that, he's that was written some. Oh. Awesome, yeah. That's he amazing. said after after the space program. <laughs> he gave up on sci-fi. <laughs> he said, this is too important. My job is now communicating science to the public. Wow. No, and he, he won the ACS Science Communication Award, too, after oh, that, really? actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Not really, yeah. Did really... he write 1, 2, 3, Infinity? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. That's a, that's a book I made all my kids yeah. read. And one of the chapters in there is like, if you have a bunch of monkeys in a room and typewriters, could they come up with all the yeah. all the works of Shakespeare? Infinite and the answer monkeys. is yes, but it's about 20 times the age of the universe. <laughs> they did the math. <laughs> so one of my kids for his bar mitzvah, his speech was, what's the probability of God actually existing? And, and, and did, yeah. Wow. That is a no. brave bar mitzvah speech. Yeah, it was a great bar mitzvah speech. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. Yeah, one of my favorite sci-fi authors is uh, Kurt Vonnegut. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Who actually had a biochemistry degree. So he, he's a chemist that went on to write science fiction. Oh, brilliant. He, brilliant legit yeah. science inside of it. But again, it's one of those spend certain aspects of it. Oh, he's written so many great books. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Okay. And, and he also, as much as anybody, many science fiction authors bring in the psychological, the socio, 
social implications yeah, and the economic and political econo yeah it, it and that's what's the great thing i mean if you want if you see the movie dune which i was a kid i read the, all the books um that wasn't so much about science fiction as, as about prejudice yeah and and trying to get you know how do you deal with uh you know if you're not accepted in a society mm -hmm. and so both its political, social commentary. That's why Star Trek was so popular. Oh, it just, yeah. It, it just masked it under the guise of science fiction, but it's it's really relevant events, of relevant discussions. I really appreciate that. If I have to tuck it all, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> we'll count it as a victory, the little ones. Ah. All right, we have about five minutes left with our guest today, uh, Dr. Laura Green, who's an expert at quantum materials, magnetic materials, is a director at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, which we're streaming from live right now in front of an audience. Um, if you guys have any questions, you can throw them in chat. She is happy to answer them over her next five minutes playing Big Bump by Burger King, <laughs> which is a fun random game. I, th I think I picked up a magnet. I really worked hard to get there. Pulling with you. But now I, I, I lose track of where I am. <laughs> Um, a couple follows. Argon, thank you for the follow. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Pedigree, thank you for as well. Um, usually we stream every other Wednesday night. The next one will be on March 15th. But today we have a special stream from the MagLab Open House. Yeah, we are live in front of an audience right now, which is kind of terrifying, but kind of fun as well. Usually I can't I'm, even see him past the screen, so I'm good. <laughs> yeah, the lights are, are pretty blind. And, and you're you're a very good interviewer. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you. We, we've practiced a bunch. Hamsterlicious, thank you for the gifts. Uh, you, you don't need to support us, but we always appreciate that you do and now you join us and ask questions we really really appreciate it. all right professor exp wants to know you mentioned working with former grad student what was your secret to not traumatizing them so they still like you why don't your students hate you after grad school is the question so i will tell you that every laboratory has its own personality every yeah. director have their own personality and some people do get pretty tra traumatized um I, I think that's one of the problems in physics is people want to just tell you, oh, you know, we're going to weed you out. You're not smart enough. And if you don't have your Nobel Prize by the 20 or 20 seconds, hang it up. Yep. Whereas, no, I mean, we want people from all different areas make their contributions. Some people are better at this or that, the other thing. So I try to understand what my students' strengths are and work with them. And if they have weaknesses, either you help them with that or you don't do that. And so I'm interested in having the students be successful in whatever science they want to do. Uh, if they want to just do a simple degree and go into this, you know, I don't think my students should all go into academia at all. I think it's a terrible idea. And so there's a lot of different things you can do. Yeah. Having said that, just like being a teenager, in a graduate student's life, there has to be some point where they think their advisor is just a total idiot mm -hmm. and they gave them completely the wrong advice because that's part of the growing process. They all go through it. They get through the other side. I get along with all of my old graduate students. I even get along with my old thesis advisor, which you never would have guessed that during my thesis writing. So, I mean, that's when I talked about gamifying like achievements in life. Well, one of the big ones for me with grad students is when they tell me I'm wrong and they're yeah. being right. Like that's a threshold that happens in year three or four. It's, it's a all, milestone. It's all it's all part of growing up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and developing as a scientist and. I mean, the other thing I like to do with uh, grad students is, is view them as collaborators more than minions. Yeah. I think that's a, it's, it's a much more respectful and healthy relationship. And it's Absolutely. The, the grad students I see hating their advisor most, it's because it's a unidirectional relationship. It's not reciprocal. That is a really good point. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. One more round. I want to do one more. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. We're... we're uh, the way I described this to Laura is a podcast with games in the background. Is that? And they're really in the background. <laughs> it is. They're, they're so far in the background that you can't even see them. Yeah. It's entertaining visuals plus a little bit of uh, questions. Man. Uh, all right. I'm going to start with, or I'm going to close with one question. If you had to start over in the sciences and pick a different discipline, which route would you go? Like we're talking sociology, archaeology, anthropology. Oh, you want to know the truth? Yes. Psychology. 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 If, if we're grinding it out to the social sciences, I love studying psychology. I love understanding what causes people to do what. I think it's important for, the, for science. And in, in many of my committees that I'm in, I will insist on having a social scientist involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, it's so interesting because people are so different. 
And you, you need to, in, when you collaborate with someone, you may get mad at them or decide they don't know how to do something, but you need to understand where they're coming from. And, and they'll give you a whole new perspective. So, yeah, probably psychology. Yeah, I, I love human behavioral behavior, understanding it. It's, it's beautiful. And it's such a hard thing. Like Hamsterlicious says, humans are complicated. Running and experiments so on humans are even harder. It's so important that, you know, people take care of their psychology makeup and, um, you know, you could get a bruise and you can get depressed. You yeah. can you know, get the flu or you could have another, you know, so, so it all has to be looked at as a holistic way, but just for the research itself, yeah. it's an open field. Oh, absolutely. And it's one of those things I appreciate about sociology experiments is you'll often see like a report where it's like, well, duh, we know that's true, but somebody has to do the study to show that it's true or that it's not. Yeah. Because our intuition is oftentimes garbage. Like, that's why you need the experiments. That's exactly, we're on the same page. Yeah. No, it's respect to sociologists who have to deal with human experiments. All right, we just crossed the 1130 mark. Laura, uh, thank you very much for joining thank me you. for Ask a Scientist Dr. Gaming. This was really it has been a lot of fun. It was really fun. I survived it. I wasn't sure, but thank you very much. Yeah, no, it's, it's been great having you on. Uh, any parting words for the audience? I'm beginning to value it, and that just like you're having fun with the games, Science is a heck of a lot of fun, and I have there's a lot of sweat, but I really have fun doing it, and I just want to get that across. Awesome, thank you very much, Laura, for joining us. Uh, so those of you that just joined us, we're streaming live from the Magnet Lab. I'm actually going to be here till three o'clock, and so we're going to have our, our next guest will start at 12, uh, Dr. Uh, DeBroco, who will talk about magnetic resonance imagery, MRIs, NMRs, spectroscopy, microwave technology. Um, so we're going to take a half hour break till we get our next guest set up, and then we'll start streaming at uh, noon again. So uh, st stick around, Huggy Beer. You didn't miss all the magnets. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, you missed out on Laura's stream, but we will be back. So yeah, stick around. I'm going to keep the stream live for the next half hour, but we'll be back in about 30 minutes. So thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you in about 30 minutes.